Everybody, welcome to this January issue of Staffing Monthly, and we are here, and we're going to be kicking your year off, right? I actually have somebody that I've had the chance to get to know pretty well over the last few months, and he is someone that I hold in high regard based on what he's actually done in his professional career in the staffing industry because he's been to the top of the mountain. He has actually been a leader that has scaled staffing organizations to you know the top 1% in this industry in the country. And now he's in a role where with Charted Path, he's actually being sought after as the most trusted advisor to some of the biggest staffing firms in the country that are the most successful, that are just leaning on him for guidance and expertise. And it is really my distinct honor to, to introduce you to Mike Cleveland of Charted Path. And Mike, I want to welcome you to the show, man. I'm, I'm grateful to have you here with Staffing Monthly. Well, thanks for the great intro. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. So I obviously I knew your backstory a little bit and I was pretty impressed by the growth that you've had. And for those that you don't know, Mike Cleland, I'd be remiss. This isn't the first time I'll do this, but he wrote my favorite book in <laughs> staffing. Uh, I love this book. Uh, when I see you in March at Executive Forum, I'm going to have you sign it. So don't, uh, uh, yeah. don't make it awkward for me. But <laughs> so Anyway, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop fanboying here, man. I'm a big fan of what you do, but I want to get into, you know, what you do for your clients for this industry. And that's really why I wanted to, to have you kick off our, our January session is you are the trusted advisor. You know, you're working with people. You just took these companies probably through a year end strategic planning process to, to close out a year and then start this one off the right way. So I'd love if you could just get into that. Like, what are you teaching your clients about strategic planning and making sure that you're setting a plan in motion properly? Well, I mean, the first thing is to really understand where, where your company is currently at and what it needs, where it needs to improve. So a lot, of, a lot of organizations right now are looking into next year saying, I mean, are we really ready for a potential slowdown? Are we geared up? And we've had, I mean, probably a good solid 10 years, at least in some segments of staffing, where there hasn't been any kind of slowdown. We have a lot of producers who have never seen it. We have a lot of salespeople that have never really had to sell in an environment where they have to fight for business necessarily. So it's a different, uh, it, and that requires a lot of different capabilities. And so there are a lot of owners that either don't realize they don't actually don't have that business development capability, um, or they do realize that it's kind of atrophied through all this and they need to rebuild it. So that's kind of step one is like, are you really, are you ready if there is a slowdown? Are you built for it? And are you ready to execute? Um, and outside of that, obviously there's a, you know, when it comes to strategic planning or planning for anything, it just, it's kind of a concept that it c covers a lot of areas because true strategic planning, at least some people see it as like, well, where's my place in the market you know, do I have to look at my offerings? You know, is my value proposition the right, all that kind of stuff. But for staffing, maybe 10% of companies are really taking a look at how they're approaching the market. When you look at strategic planning, it, is, it has more to do with operationally, are we ready? And what improvements do we actually need to put into place that may take time in order for us to be ready? So, um, you know, one of the better uh, definitions I've heard of strategic planning is that it's kind of the non-business as usual activities or things you have to do that are outside of your day-to-day -day in order to make your organization competitive, more competitive. And I've always had the belief that, especially in staffing, we're kind of in a red ocean environment. You have so yeah. many, you have over 20,000 staffing firms. So somebody's getting better. Somebody's getting better in your market, in your segment, ready to take your business. So if you don't have a plan to improve, that means you're falling behind. And I think that's the mentality most leaders in our industry need to have. So a lot that's really a lot of what strategic planning is. And so there are times, Dan, where strategic planning can actually be pretty tactical. Yeah, yeah. You're getting down to like, look, you know, there's a, I mean, an ex example of this. I was working with a firm that had done a lot of automation for their sourcing and they were a very community oriented staffing firm. And they'd spent a lot of money on automation and they just weren't getting the same candidates that they were in the past. They had to completely reinvent and bring back what they did in the past, the community events, the networking, mm. all those type of things they used to do, the billboards, the, the just that presence within that, that really made them a household name. Yeah. But that, you know, a job board doesn't. So it's sometimes it's about going back to what you left. 
and, and putting it back in place. So, so it's really about what are the things I can do that have the biggest impact in my organization, both in the short and long term that I need to be able to implement. So that, that makes a ton of sense. And obviously just focusing on the advertising to become a household name just makes sense. Like if you think of the companies like Geico and Progressive, like everybody that's 16 or older knows who Geico and Progressive are. Like they yes. really, from a, from a brand equity standpoint, they've got no advantage to keep advertising like that. And then you got to ask like, why would a company that's a household name already keep spending the money on it? And the answer is, so they stay a household name. So they stay right? a household name. You know, because right. un unfortunately, Americans, we just got short-term memory. You know, that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that, Dan. I always tell people that before I even take an engagement, it's, it's uh, my dad was a physician. And uh, it's almost like, it's almost in a way, it's first do no harm. And what I mean by that is you have to really understand what you do well and don't take it for granted. You yeah. have to understand why you win. And I think a lot of people, we were talking about this earlier, a lot of people are very talented and gifted. And they think some of the things that occur within their organization are just natural, where they actually could be real differentiators. And so you just really have to appreciate why you win and make sure that any changes that you make protect those things and take those things into account. I've seen that, you know, uh, and obviously you and I have a little bit of overlap in this area, but I, I've worked with some clients that are very talented. I mean, they're very intelligent mm -hmm. and they don't even recognize it. So one of the, the best, I guess, maybe gifts that I have is I help people see in themselves what I see in them, you yeah, know, and I kind right. of affirm their their expertise and, and maybe help them grow into it. And mm -hmm. I, I so I, I agree with you there. But how do we how does an operation do that? Like you, you, you said earlier, the first step is really just to take stock and where you're at, you know, and are you are you prepared for what the market might give you? And there's right. talk of a downturn. So like, walk me through that. Like if I'm an agency, how do I really take stock in where I'm at? You know, if, if I'm biased, right? Like how yeah. do I do that? You know, the first thing is, is as a company grows, it's very natural for an executive and their management team to become more and more internally focused, to focus on what's going on in the business and the problems that they're focusing on. And they become almost myopic in how they view the world, right? They, they lose that external perspective of what's happening outside of their own business. So they think if they're like working, you know, if they're just working on their own engine, then everything's fine, but they're not looking at the road ahead, if that makes sense. So the first thing is to make sure that you're getting a solid external perspective of what's happening out there. So that means either, uh, you know, for an executive, Obviously, there's there's networking opportunities, associations, you know, just being out there, putting yourself out there. And it's also having really good conversations with your sales team and asking them questions in terms of what they're seeing out there uh, to do a temperature check. You know, obviously, I'm a consultant. I do believe in consultants because they'll ask you questions you've never thought of before. And it, that is that is also helpful to have somebody kind of challenge your assumptions a little bit. I had to go in there and work with somebody that's seen a lot of different things and how they and how they work, knowing that there's not a one size fit all scenario, but at least making sure that you're you're looking at every piece of it and making sure that you're not, uh, you know, like I said, either taking things for granted or have a blind spot in the end, like in, you know, behind the wheel, like we talked about, one of the things was at least making managers aware of all the key capabilities they need to keep their eye on and how they look at it. So if you look at sales, for example, be very honest with yourself and your company. Do I really have true business development capabilities? And what I mean by that is a lot of sales is actually more account management or even rec management. Yeah. So do you really have business development capabilities? What value are your account managers actually bringing to the table? Are your recruiters actually capable of sourcing or have they relied too much on those tools? And so just look at you know what your true capabilities are and try to do that as a neutral way as possible is really where you want to start. My biggest concern, what I worry the most about, and I mentioned it earlier, is the business development side. I just think that's a blind spot for a lot of firms. Um, on the recruiting side, you know, that's that's a whole other story. But um, I think uh, you know a lot of recruiters, we've automated so much, and I don't know if this is me being old fashioned, since I've been in the industry since '94, but they there's not that old school type of recruiting and qualification it's almost like processing people in a lot of ways so knowing you know what are your true delivery capabilities is really important as well so there's two two key things that i want to dig into there one is about you know 
looking at the core competencies or your core strengths and seeing what what each of your managers should be focusing on. I want to talk about that in a second, but I also do want to say, obviously, bias, but I'm I'm pro consultant as well, and I've always looked at it just like professional sports. You know, when you're when the kids are in little league or you know, kind of junior league sports. Like there might be one coach and there are usually a couple of, you know, parents that are volunteering. Right? right. And then you get into high school and there's a couple coaches maybe, you know, and then it's like you get into college and the, and the coaching staff, you know, is paid better. They're trained better, you know, and there's more of them. But then you get to the elite of the elite and you get to the levels of the pros. And there is like coaches upon coaches. I mean, there's like assistant position coaches. Right. right. Like it's and the, right. and the reason being is because the stakes are higher. Right. And I just. I look at business at that at that level. If you want to ex- excel to stratospheric success and you want to be playing with the pros and get to the top one, two percent in the industry, like you need coaches that are looking out for you because you run that that risk that you just mentioned is sometimes owners will say, if I wasn't doing something right, I wouldn't be as successful as I am, which is true. And, and they should be credited for the success that they have. But the downfall is at some point, it's only going to get you so far. And without yeah. somebody giving you that holistic view and checking your blind spots, you don't know when that so far is going to show up and how it's going to show up. And it could be catastrophic. So like, I'm, yeah. I'm with you on the pro coaching side, but I just had a conversation with someone the other day that, that the other thing that you mentioned is very timely. So recruiting team, and they have uh, a little bit of full desk uh, responsibilities, a little bit of business development responsibilities. And I was chatting with this team and they were concerned that new management, new leadership was going to commoditize them, make them a number, right? And make everything about hitting quotas and, hey, are you doing this? Are you doing that? And just kind of like strip the human element away. So how do you balance that? Like, how do you how do you measure core companies in in a qualitative data set where you can clearly look at something and say, hey, we need to improve here? without stripping away the human element and and making people feel like they're just a number in an organization like that's a really that? really good question and it's something that I've struggled with because I've I, you know for a long time because as a consultant you want to provide management systems for people that work for them and a management system has to dovetail nicely into the culture of the organization so a highly structured management system in an entrepreneurial or, uh, operation won't work and so it's it's there's an there's almost an art to it but when, when you look at the, um, when you look, how I look at metrics is I almost look at it at three levels of sophistication for an organization. The first level is really just learning what you need to measure, like what's important, right? And the, the second part, the second kind of stage of maturity is um, how do I analyze it to make decisions? So when I, I have this information in front of me, but what the heck, what does it tell me? How do I know what it's actually telling me? Because a number is an indicator. It's right. not a root cause. And it's it's a symptom of something else that's occurring. So, you know, a lot of times people, you know, they see a number and they say, okay, well, this is the number. So this must be what's wrong. When they're, especially if it's a ratio, it could be 10 things that are going on yeah. that are impacting that number. I, I did a I did some work with a large staffing firm. Uh, this is a while back. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, they had concerns about candidate quality because their job order close rate was going down, which is interesting, right? It's like, okay, yeah. I, I can see how that would make sense. They had that problem before. And so, you know, they, they were focused on candidate quality and their job order close rate went up. So they, they wanted me to look at the recruiting process to see what was going on. But I was like, well, I really want to look at the numbers first to make sure that we're working on the right problem. I always say it's like there's nothing harder, but nothing more important than defining the problem. Um, And defining the problem is not as easy as you might think it is. As we went through through the numbers, what we found out was that actually the close rates were fine, if not higher, for every submission that was done within 24 hours. But submissions that were done after 24 hours, the close rates went down substantially, bringing bringing down the average. So what was actually happening is a lot of their clients got to the point because they went to a VMS is that they were only, ex- they were accepting resumes, but they had so many resumes coming in. They were only looking at them for the first 24 hours. So if you had, if you had a candidate, it could have been the best candidate. It was never even looked at because it came in too late. And so once we fixed that, we saw almost an immediate rebound. Well, if you think about this, 
if you if you focused on candidate quality, you're gonna be go you're gonna become slower yeah. by nature. Yeah. So they would have made the problem worse. And I always say that like it's a, almost a solution bias. When you see a number and you've solved it one way, you tend to go back to that. Yeah. Versus it could be something a completely different root cause of it. So the analysis of the data is really, really important, understanding what it's telling you. But the third phase is how you manage to it and how you lead to it. Yeah. And that's something different, right? The, the, the determining, like, uh, you know, I was talking to metrics with a bunch of senior folks and they were like, well, you know, I've been around too long to manage the metrics. It's like, it's not the metrics that you're worried about. It's how you're going to be managed to them that you're worried about. And I think that leadership spends a lot of time discussing what they should measure, a little bit of time about what it tells them, but they almost spend no time talking about what is my management philosophy around metrics? How do we approach people that are missing metrics, right? And how do we make sure that it's built in a way that's consistent with our values and our culture? Because that third one is a cultural question. Yeah. So, I, and I think that's where people miss out. And the thing is, Dan, is I can't answer the question because it, it's different for each firm because yeah. each each culture is different. Um, it, so it, it's true. No, that's actually a really great point. And it's funny when you were talking about this, it reminded me of a story of uh, I was working with a company and they were like, well, what are the KPIs? And I was like, well, it's it's specific to the to you, to the company. Right. And they're like, well, no, just just like there's got to be like off the shelf KPIs. And I was like, well, there's KPIs that happen to appear with a lot of different agencies because we're in the same industry. But really, KPI is it's completely relative, right? Because it's just something that indicates the performance that you're going after, right? Yeah. And if you say, hey, our fill percentage of is this target, it's relative to what your desired key performance is, right? It's, there's really no bearing to that number. It just sort of says, hey, this is relative. And if it's relative in the wrong direction, then we got to look in that area and see and solve the actual problem or define the problem that we're working on. So I, I think that that's a good point. But another thing that you shared that has always hit home with me and when people say, oh, what should my KPIs be, you know, and making sure you're aligning it with the organization. I love defining the problem and then going and talking to the frontline people and say, hey, if we were going to solve this problem, how would you know we were doing that? Yeah. How would you know we were doing a good job? Mm -hmm. And they will generally give you the qualitative thing that you should be looking at. And maybe it's submissions. Maybe it's, you know, number of meetings, sales meetings you're having. If it's a business development metric, right? Like they'll tell you like how they're going to measure it. And a lot of times you can base your KPIs around what they're looking at to create that alignment. So they'll know how to respond if the number's not accurate. Right, because right. they got some ownership in it. So I, that's right. I think that that's makes a good sense. point. Like, and that's you can use strategic planning to dovetail into your metrics, your management system. So if you, let's say you know that you need a management system, you need to put it in place. Well, first of all, it doesn't matter what it is if it's not accepted by the team, right? So including right. your line level manager. So it doesn't matter if what your favorite one is. The question is, is what can you, what can be adopted by the team more effectively, and. And so using strategic planning for that by, by going through the process so they can understand the obstacles and problems and the weaknesses within the organization and have them come up with those objectives and link that to metrics, that exercise of education is a good way for sure to drive alignment. That's kind of an old balanced scorecard approach, right? It's you come up with an objective, you know, and, and I do this all the time. It's like, sit down, okay, what is the objective of this role? What are you trying to accomplish? Give me two deliverables that are measurable in this role and then discuss those objectives and, and how do you actually hit them? Um, it's, it's important because roles get diluted and um, getting down to an essence of the role is really, really important. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I want to circle back to something that you mentioned at the top of this you were talking about strategic planning as sort of taking a look and saying, how do I prepare myself for what might lie ahead? Right? right. And there's a lot of talk around recession. You know, I don't, I don't want to will it. I don't want to manifest it. Right? right. But like, there's a lot of talk around it. And some of the data that even, you know, SIA has put out indicates there's a slowdown, you know, you're starting to see more of a fall off with direct hire stuff and a little bit less demand in those key niche spaces would indicate that there's something coming. But this is another balancing act that I'm going to ask of you. How do you, how does a company remain optimistic 
and plan for growth like you like you blueprinted so nicely in this book you know how do they stay disciplined to a growth plan yet build in some level of strategy to deal with a downturn like how do you balance those two things well i think i think in a lot of ways recessions are an important um element of a somber look at your of, of a business to see what it really can and can't do it gets everybody's attention and it focuses the organization so in some ways um, it's an opportunity for firms to evaluate and improve. It's really hard to improve when things are going well. It's really hard because it demands people to change and people yeah. hate change. They hate it. Especially if it ain't broke. <laughs> right, right. If it's working, why do I need to change, right? And it's like, this is just fluff. You're doing this or whatever. But if if there's a sense of like, you know what? There's a threat. There's a looming threat potentially. Um, having that discussion with your team of where we need to improve they're more ready for that conversation. They're ready to learn. They're ready to, they're ready to adapt. And I think that that's the, that is actually to me, when I talk to firms is that we owe our team the truth. Yeah. And we owe the team to understand that even though things are going great and that's fantastic, that everything that we love about a company, everything that we do is a luxury of performance everything. And if we don't perform, everything else is at risk. And a lot of times we have to give up little things that we like in order to protect the things that gives us everything that we want, which is performance and success. And, you know, because there's nothing worse than being part of an organization that has to make cuts that's on the defensive. So a growth oriented firm, regardless of what's going on in the market, has an attitude of abundance that we're building something great and it's so great, it doesn't matter what the market is because we're going to be better than the competition. It's almost like, you know, how do you survive a bear? You outrun your, you outrun the person next to you type thing, but you have to be better than the competition. You have to be able to take market share. The growth, growth isn't occurring because the market's growing. Now it's about being great. And so, you know, the firms that grow have that fundamental attitude of, of a, but even in difficult times that, we're going to knuckle down and we're going to get through this, but we're also going to get better. They have an attitude of improvement and competitiveness and the rece uh, recession or slowdown. is just a way as a, is a temperature check on that, but there's firms, you know, in the book and things like that, that have grown through recessions that have, that have done, that have done well. So um, I think that, you know, I was talking to a firm the other day and, you know, they're about 15 million and they're a very consultative staffing firm. And they were talking about the recession. I said, this is your time to shine. It's like, this is where you tell your team, this is the value that we bring. We can actually bring this to the table now because you're, you, because now you have this added value that you can really show. And it's not just buried among a bunch of different firms. You can tell your team, no, this is, this is why we're better. And this is how we're going to do it. So I think it's just going back to the roots and making sure the team understands that it's, this is not, this is not, a fatal situation. This is not a time to look in the mirror and feel sorry for ourselves. It's a time to prove ourselves because, you know, it, because it, that's the nature of this business. I, I love that. I love that. And I'm going to, I'm going to share something with you that I've never actually told you. It was a piece of, I, and there's many insights. I, I truly like, I know when we first talked, I, I said, I love the book and you, you know, you and Barry were like, like, is it really like, is there that many books? Like, yeah, like, I think you guys were really thought like I was like kind of out of my mind by how much I was kind of effusing praise about it. But there's a lot of insights I gained, but there's one insight that I think is very relevant to what we're talking about as it relates to the market and that I, that I, I learned and applied to my model out of, out of your insight in this book. And that's about how the market expands and contracts, right? Like the staffing industry is an industry and we as agencies are a small part of that industry one of twenty thousand plus right? right and the staffing industry is just a part of the economy right so if there's a recession in the economy and the economy scales back there's a chance that the staffing industry might scale back too the beautiful thing is is it doesn't mean that you within that staffing industry have to scale back right, right? you can just say you can ha have a strategy to say hey our way to insulate ourselves is we're just going to take we're going to make sure someone else is scaling back even more. We're going to take their market share, right? And 
yeah, overall, like we might, our business might decline 10%, but we're going to go and we're going to take 12% of someone else's business. So we actually grow 2%. And in the face of a recession, 2% growth can be celebrated, you know, at scale, right? So like that, so that, that mindset was you have to measure your growth or your decline and count the growth or decline of the industry, right? right. Like if you grow 5% and the industry expanded 10%, you kind of went backwards, right? right? Right. That's exactly right. Well, not only that, like, just think that through too, when you're talking about that, it's like a, a leader that wants to grow something. It's all about building a great company and in staffing, it's about your people, right? In the end, in the front, you have the tools and everything else, it's fine, but it's, it's really about your people and you want to make your people great. People become great in difficult times. Like, and so if you, when, when you can build an organization that can that can take that 2%, that can grow that grow that 2% in a think of what that same team can do in a great economy. And and that and that's why you see growth as like it's not this linear thing. It's a yeah. it kind of plateaus and spikes and plateaus and it's because those folks even in difficult times they were growth oriented. They never thought of anything but growth. They never got defensive. They are always like, how does this make us better? How does this make us better? And they invested the time and energy and money. You know, they were willing to, to you know, take a cut themselves to make this, to make the company how they wanted it. And it paid, you know, dividends in the, in the, in the future for years and years, the, the decisions that they made um, when, the, when the times were down. There are folks, and I know COVID was absolutely brutal, but there are folks that kind of stripped their team down the folks that did strip their team down are having a heck of a time recovering. Yeah. You know, and because it's just so hard to rebuild. So um, yeah, just that growth mentality. We talk about commitment to growth in the book and that's really what it's about. It's like, yeah. it's a gut check. What's it's really true. important. Growth, growth is not, it's not an activity. It's not really a result. It is a, it is a behavior. And more importantly, it's a, it's a discipline. Like yeah. you have to be committed to it. You have to be intentional about it. You know? So I got two other things I want to get into quickly with the time that we have left. And the first one, just kind of segueing from that is how do you, how do you take it to the industry? Like, how do you compete against your, like, what is your best play? Like if you are a consultant and you're consulting with an organization that wants to grow in the face of this adversity. And you're like, Hey, we've got to be better than our competition. What's the best play in your playbook? Like, what is the thing that you say, Hey, this is what we need to do to measure where we're at against the competition and how we're going to outperform them. Like what, what's your go-to there? Well, I think the first thing is just is real clarity and focus more than anything else. Like when, when, when things are going really well, um, companies have a tendency to take on business, even though they don't necessarily need to take on. They're just, and so one of the things is to understand is like, like I kind of go back to before is, you know, why do you win? What makes you great? And are there some fundamentals that you've let go through these good times? And, um, and I've always, I've always said too, it's like that, it, that in times like this, the if if the chief executive or the main operator can be more externally focused meeting with don't just worry about you know what the spreadsheets are telling you go out and talk to clients get out yeah. there and talk to people get outside of your own little bubble and listen to what's out there um and and making and, and retraining the team to also have that attitude making the most of every conversation passing passing leads and market intelligence along to the team all those kind of fundamentals that we really haven't had time for over the last 10 years are now critical disciplines move operational disciplines you know moving forward and also just knowing you know like a, knowing what business you really really need to 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 support and so there are a lot of firms now that are kind of you know stuck in the middle of this kind of vms versus retail world and things like that yeah. um you know that typically in situations like this the the vms can really t turn down like a dial really quickly and so you really have to take a stock of like okay short term we're taking this hit what are we going to do to be able to make up for it so just be very cognizant of what's what's going on but there's, there's, unfortunately, there's not a single playbook out there. You know, it's, 
it's, uh, you know, when you're going into this market and not sure of it, I guess the biggest thing you need to be aware of is the potential blind spots, both internally and externally, that you've been able to get away with over the last 10 years and been still been able to grow and uh, just get outside of your organization and make and try to build a sales driven company. And, um, you know, I was, I was working with a firm and they're like, they have all these tools and processes, but they don't have a plan on how to engage customers and how to and how to really convey value to their customers and how to do proper business development, both from an HR procurement or even line level management standpoint. But they have all this online marketing stuff that they're doing. And they're like, well, it's not pulling in the leads. It's like the basics still work. The fundamentals still work. Yeah, I believe yeah. in marketing. I believe in the automation stuff. That's fine. But it's not a replacement. No. Or talking people. And that's fundamentally what we need to be doing is we need to be talking to people. And, um, and, uh, and I think that that's the basic fundamental we have to get out there, get the meeting numbers up and you know just listen to what's out there. You know, what's funny in a very ironic sort of way about that right there is if you ask any recruiting professional, if AI or online platforms that without a recruiter are ever going to replace the recruiting industry, they will bite your head off. They will defend it and be like, no way. You have to have the human involved. You have to do this. You have to do that. Yet at the same time, we want to sit back and pull the human out of the sales side of it and expect to just sell digitally with no human interaction and expect people just to roll in and buy our overly commoditized service. Right, like, right, right. What's going it on here, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. And it's it's frustrating because, again, like I, I was taught this business by a guy named Al Dubuque back in the 90s. And his whole... So it's fundamentally, this business is people selling people to people. And I was like, that is basically what it is. Yeah. Your relationships, who you know, whether that re the, whether those relationships are with, you know, MSP stakeholders or with, or with the line level manager, it's all about it. And so part of me feels like all the talk about technology, because it's, 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 it's kind of um, pushed aside the art of sales. And fundamentally, yeah. we're a sales driven business. And, you know, and um, both on the recruiting side and the sales side, like we have to learn how to develop relationships and how to keep promises and, you know, how to deliver for our clients and consultants and, and, and be able to build enough trusting relationships that even if we make a mistake, you know, we have enough goodwill to be able to work through them. And it's, it's, um, I, I think that the, I remember when VMS came out, they're like, oh, this is going to kill the industry. It doesn't kill the industry. AI is not going to kill the industry. But, the, but you're, you're right. It's like those recruiters are the same recruiters that are sitting there waiting on their inbox for their applicants to come in. Yeah. You know, they're the, not. Yeah. The sad thing is, and I, I hate to say it, but the industry, how fragmented it is and how, I guess, I don't know, laissez-faire laissez that we've been with our quality controls over the years kind of invited VMS and MSPs to fill the gap because they just sold. They said, hey, how would you like to have performance metrics and data and visibility and accountability to your staffing program? And all the buyers on the HRs are like, oh, my God, that would be amazing. I've been asking my vendors for that forever, and they just can't get their act together with it. And then the MSP is like, yeah, and we'll make them pay for it, you right. know, and it's sure. like, who's not like that? That's got to be the easiest thing in the world to sell, in my opinion. But so, um, to go back to your question, like you were asking earlier, I, you know, part of me wonders whether it's... um you know, what, what uh, executives should be thinking about is, you know, do is really evaluate the relationships they have with their clients and consultants and how do they want to engage them differently in a difficult environment? And do they have the people out there that are making and building those relationships? Cause in a, in a, like I said, in a candidate driven and a client driven market, you know, you, you can get by cause the demand's so high, but man, it's in the end, that's your biggest insurance policy and your bigger, biggest foundation for growth. And the, and the other part of it too is, even if there isn't a slowdown, you're still better off, <laughs> yeah. you know, by looking at it that way. So, yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's a good, so, good point. I think that. just keeping an eye on the time, I think that's a good spot to land this plane. And just to, if I can memorialize that action item right there for anyone watching this is build that into your performance management plan this year. Work with your, your frontline people, your account managers, your recruiters, your salespeople, whoever it is for you that hold the key relationships and ask them to take stock of that relationship and have some sort of quantifiable way to measure it just to, as a baseline to say, hey, this is, 
I would rate this relationship a four right now, or I would relation, I would rate it an eight, whatever it is, and then look at it and then be intentional about building and strengthening those relationships through the year. And then do it again next year and see if you've made a, a significant improvement in that area. And I think that I think that you're right, Mike. I think that if you really focus on that relationship, it's going to help insulate you through tough times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, it's funny. It's we make a lot of changes in these investments and things like that, but we make them to benefit ourselves. And a lot of times we don't look at how it impacts how our clients and consultants work with us and how it impacts their experience. Um, and I've oh, worked true. with some firms there and they're like, it's not the same as it used to be. It's like, yeah, because we build things to make it efficient for us, but it's made it less effective for our clients and consultants to work with us or contractors to work with us. And, and in the end, that's, that's what really matters. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I've seen it in my own, you know, consumer lifestyle, right? There's things that I'm like, oh, like, why did this company change this format or why do I have to buy it this way? And I can't, right. you know, get anybody on the phone, right? Like right. sometimes like you just sometimes you just want to talk to somebody, right? And like, if you can't, it makes me not want to do business with them. And I feel like they just made those changes to optimize their business and, and improve their bottom line, right? right? But then a company like Amazon, I feel like they're always thinking like, what does the consumer want next? And, and yeah, I do want the thing that I just push the button to buy on my doorstep in four hours, right? That's exactly what I want. Thank you, Jeff Bezos. Like, right, thank you for right, that. So, right, exactly. exactly. I, I think that is a, it's a, it's good insight there. And last thing, last comment I'm going to make, um, because you just mentioned about it's about keeping promises, and you shared a piece of insight with me that I did not know that I'm going to share with the world now is that you've written two books, uh, Behind mm -hmm. the Wheel, that's really an operation man manual. You've written my favorite staffing book, Breaking Through, that is all about the disciplines necessary to grow and scale your agency to get into the top 1% or half percent in this industry. Um, but you're also embarking on writing a third book because in your first book, you said you were going to write three. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's, that's right. integrity. Um, any, any teasers about what the third book is going to be about? Not yet, because I have to work with Barry on it. We're tossing around a few ideas, and uh, but we should know we should have it nailed down by Q1. But if it's, I mean, if it's what I think it's going to be, it's going to take a good year and a half to to get done to write research and write. But it's it's definitely going to feed off of breaking through, um, and uh, it's almost going to be I wouldn't say a sequel, but maybe an enhancement to it. I sure. love it. I love it. Well, I'll look forward to it, and whenever you uh, finish the book. You know, maybe the three of us can actually do a staffing monthly interview to kind of discuss it with yeah. the world and really promote it because it really is good. And for anyone out there that's that's watching this, if you've not read Breaking Through, I I try this book goes with me. Like I I literally I travel with this book. It's got you know notes and underline. Like this thing is, it's it's the best that you're gonna get in the industry because it's not it's it's the insight of a guy that's been at the top of the mountain combined with all of the data and analysis of the entire industry. Like it just does not get better than that. And it actually is real world stories of, of companies that have actually done these principles and these disciplines to get where they want to go. So um, Mike, listen, man, I'm grateful to have you here. I am always, always love the conversations and the insights that you share. And I am looking forward to catching up in person at executive forum here in a couple months. That sounds great. I, I appreciate the time. I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>